Hello everyone, Harry here, Harry Van Haren, uh, working as a network software engineer for Intel. Uh, thanks very much to the previous two, two speakers as well for a great talk, but also introducing a lot of the concepts that I'm gonna, gonna continue and, and talk about in this talk as well. So great scheduling on behalf of the DPDK uh, events committee to, to group these things together. Uh, nice to, to be able to yeah, have a, a, a latency jitter uh, yeah, slot, I suppose and to, to really focus on, on those aspects. Um, a lot of the things I'm talking about here are, are quite representative of what the, the previous talk was about, but instead of talking about the device under test or OVS, uh, I will be talking about the traffic generation side and how to accurately measure things like jitter and latency. So some of the questions, uh, particularly at the end of the session there, were, were very accurate and, and things that I'd like to expand on. Um, I have a 20 minute slot here and, and I have quite a few slides with some detail. So I'll walk through them quite quickly and then uh, I'll, I'll try and keep as much time as I can at the end for questions and, and for interactive uh, questions. Of course, if anyone has a, a particular topic that they'd like to discuss with me, my email is uh, harry.fan.haren at intel.com. You can reach out to me. I'm on the DPDK mailing list as well. So quick introduction to, to, to what this talk is about. Uh, a couple of years ago, I started contributing towards OVS, uh, particularly optimizing the data path. Um, what that involves is generating some traffic and then trying to switch even faster. As mentioned in the previous talk, sometimes OVS spends some cycles actually switching packets. Uh, that's what I was working to, to optimize to make faster, so less cycles per packet. And in order to do that, of course, you need to have a traffic generator that's easy to use. Um, by the way that I, I work here, uh, we have a couple of different machines that, that I deploy on and that I, that I test OVS and, and things with. So it's helpful to have a traffic generator that's really simple to set up that we can run quickly between uh, different machines. So, so easy to run and low or no dependencies outside of DPDK just to, to quickly blast some traffic at, at an OVS instance of, of traffic with different types. Um, and, that, and that really helps to kind of figure out, uh, you know, my workflow for, for accurately and quickly developing on OVS with different traffic. Um, so what I'd like to get from this traffic generator is, is performance, latency, and jitter numbers. That they're, they're ultimately the three things we care about. Um, millions of packets per second, preferably a stable value of that, and then latency and jitter, uh, as previously hinted in, in, in the last talk, uh, measuring averages is, is one way to approach this, or histograms or, or some kind of plotting is, is a slightly better way. Um, and then lastly, kind of a simple usable interface that, that if somebody asks me, hey, Harry, how, how do I, you know, get some Ethernet IP UDP traffic out of this traffic generator that I don't need to spend hours either sending them config scripts or, or something, but just something really, really easy to use. And, and my experience here is that Scappy, the, the Python module for generating packets is really best in class. It's a pleasure to work with, in my opinion. And, you know, a string like here at the bottom of the screen is, is really the best we can, we can do to describe a complex packet, but at the same time to, to easily compose those and be able to type them quickly on the command line. So what's my use case, or why am I, I talking about traffic generation in general? Um, as I mentioned, we were optimizing the OVS data path. As part of that, we parse packets, so different types of packets. And we were doing that with SIMD instructions, AVX 512 specifically. But really, the use case there is that we need to be able to generate a wide variety of different types of packets with different field set, like IP sources and desks, but also a whole bunch of invalid packets and things like that to really stress test the parsing code that we have in OVS. Uh, specifically the optimized versions that we were building. So to prototype interactively here was very important that we could easily blast a new type of, uh, of packet at, at, at OVS. Apart from that, uh, I worked a bit on various DPDK components and being able to easily generate a packet, so an mbuff with a particular packet content in unit test code was something that I found uh, a little tedious and you know you often end up actually casting pointers of Ethernet and IPv4 and then you know all the various header types and filling them in one by one as C structures and that's I, I found error prone but also just takes a long time and, and to get those casts right and then to calculate the checksums and things there's helper functions in uh, libnet of course of dpdk but even still it was just more effort because it's not the value add of the unit test i was building i wanted one simple command to be able to generate this packet for me uh, that's my second use case so if we had a library for example rtdgen that we pass a string ideally that same string as i typed before scappy like uh, and it just gives me an mbuff back or a burst of mbuffs back perhaps, then that would be really useful for me. And lastly, I want this library to also be able to do performance measurements. So performance, latency and jitter. Um, 
use that same string again. I, I focus very much on usability, so I want to be able to copy paste the same thing between interactive usage, unit tests, and our traffic generation routines. And I'd like about 100 million packets a second of that, because ultimately, if you're doing packet generation and, and stress testing, you need to be able to generate a huge amount of traffic to, to really stress out a, a full system. Um, let's go into a little more detail about exactly performance, latency, and jitter because those are, are very interesting uh, properties. I think RFC 2544 and some other things were already mentioned earlier. As I said, we're tying in quite nicely on this session. Um, so MPPS, our million packets per second, gives a good raw performance indicator, but really the no drop rate, which means you know zero or n number of packets dropped in a run or per unit time, um, gives a consistent performance metric. And that's actually much more valuable than than raw per se, uh, you know, raw with a, a huge latency and things like that doesn't really help. You don't want your, your burst size to be maxed out all the time. It means you'll drop some packets. So consistent performance is something that I focused on more than absolute performance measurements. And that's something that I want my traffic generator, hence this library, to be able to, to tell me the developer. If we look at latency and jitter, uh, microseconds of latency, perhaps nanoseconds of, of jitter, uh, as the previous satellite uh, or um, presentation had you know uh, 10 10 to 14 15 microseconds of latency from end to end between two systems is, is quite reasonable um but jitter we'd like to have more resolution there to to, to be able to really zone in on on what particular packets or, or what or what are the root causes of jitter in a system as opposed to uh, an overseeable amount of consistent latency so easy insight into the resulting data is then the, the last part that, that I find as a developer, you can see I'm focusing on usability of the strings, but I also want insight and consistency from the performance and insight into that resulting data. Um, I explicitly use insight here uh, as opposed to a graph or something like that. Uh, we, what we want to do is to easily understand value from metrics. We don't want to look at data and try and infer something and then get insight from it. We want to just have that insight presented straight and very obviously to us. So question to the audience, um, is this good enough? Is these two performance statements or statements uh, on latency and performance that we have on the right, is this the best we can do? Can we do any better? In general, we're being told here that application has X amount of performance at a specific packet size. That seems pretty indicative, pretty useful, right? Um, and then the application here says it's average 20 microseconds, so that's our microseconds of latency, with an average of 300 nanoseconds of jitter across something. Can we do better? I think yes. So in the performance world, we need to be saying, is this a no drop test or not? And how many packets are allowed to drop either per run or as a percentage? Now, a lot of benchmarking does this, right? I'm, I'm kind of just making a point that, you know, if, if we're talking about performance, it, it gets a little more complex that we do really need to, to have various uh, kind of, you know, this performance at this, at this, at this, with this type of thing. Um, so packet size is usually quite important, as, as was hinted in the previous uh, presentations with the latency sloping up at different rates based on the packet size um, and, and, and the no drop rate itself. Of course, then there's also the question in the latency side, oh, an average latency of 20 microseconds, how useful is that? What does that actually tell us? And an average jitter of 300 nanoseconds, what does that tell us? And for anyone who says, oh, no, that, that was good, um, you're getting some homework, um, averages are pretty bad in general. To, to, uh, they're a bad way of thinking about latency and jitter. So percentiles is a whole lot more helpful. There's a talk here, and in the PDF version of the slides, these are clickable links, so you can get to the right talk automatically. Um, Giltine uh, does a great talk on how to not measure latency. Um, kind of leads you multiple times astray on purpose into, like, you think this will be fine, and then it really turns out to not be. Great talk, highly recommended for anyone interested in measuring performance and latency. Um, there's a, a library that he recommends, or rather he, he wrote the first version of, and now there's multiple languages, bindings, and things to that library called HDR Histogram, High Dynamic Range. Uh, it's a good way to measure uh, and, and to kind of um, collect results of multiple packets, jitter and latency, and to plot them. So the real value out of using that HDRH or HR histogram library is that there's some tools around it, and that's why I recommend it for people who are, who are starting out, um, to plot it as a histogram. Now, I say a histogram. Technically, it's this thing called a CDF, or a cumulative distribution function. I cheat. I write these things out on the slides because I always forget what they stand for. But really, the value is graphically seeing your latency. Watch out with this type of graph because sometimes the x-axis and y-axis are inverted, they're flipped. So rather than looking like this, it looks like that. Um, 
that's the important things to check. I'll zoom in on this graph because I want to just talk about it for two seconds and show people why this is so useful to think about. If we look, uh, there's a link here at the top called HDR plot. It's a Python script that will plot your HDR histogram and plot it into a graph just like this one. Um, on the x-axis, we have the percentile of the data point. Note it's a log scale. So 25% is here, 50% is still way on the left-hand side where we would expect it to be in the middle, right? So this log scale is vitally important. And it goes all the way up to six nines. On the y-axis, you have latency. I think latency on the y-axis makes a lot of sense because latency goes up and it literally moves up in the graph as well. Um, we're benchmarking two lines here. The orange line is a data plane function with no printf. And the blue line is a data plane function with a printf. If we average these values, we'll get somewhere here in the middle around the, the 50th to 70th percentile. So somewhere here where, where my mouse cursor is now. What that means is if you look at the average latency of this function, adding a printf will have no latency impact. And that's just not true, right? This graph obviously shows that from the 90th percentile or maybe 92nd percentile onwards, there's a huge impact. So not every packet gets impacted by latency or, or gets impacted by the, the printf, but at least every, let's say, one in 100 gets an extra three or four X latency spike. So what histograms show you are latency spikes and latency um, issues across a wide number of requests. And if you average out your latencies, you're just being lied to. It's not telling you what you think it's telling you. And the worst part is that you think you're looking at the right data. And that's really like hammered home and, and really clearly explained in that Jill team talk earlier. That's, that's why I recommend it really. Um, it's really good visual examples with, with Grafana graphs and things like that, showing how that data is really, you, you think you're looking at the right thing and it's not the right thing to be looking at. So yeah, very interesting for a traffic generator as an end result, we want to use a, a library somewhat like this HDR histogram and HDR plot to graphically give us that insight into the data. So we don't want the raw data, we want the insight. And that's, I think, what this HDR plot uh, graph and reading of this graph can tell us. So that said, that's my kind of request. That's what I want. Why would we build a traffic generator library in DPDK? So as per slide three, I mentioned interactive usage, unit tests, and performance tests. Those are my three things I want to, to do with this library. So hypothetically, say we were to design a library that looks like this. Very small API space. Uh, there's a few more helper functions, but, but let's not talk about the detail. Um, you create an instance of this generator, DPDK gen library, generator library. Um, it has two APIs that we really like, uh, packet raw, which basically says, give me raw bytes and I will turn them into mbuffs and send them for you. And then a gen a packet from a string. And this is the, the usable scappy like string that I mentioned before. So those two APIs let the application or let your control kind of management thread or control plane say what type of traffic to generate. And then the gen library itself, just like ethdev, implements rxburst and txburst. So you can pull a number of mbuffs from that library and you can transmit them back into the library. Might seem a little strange at the moment to TX packets back into a generator library, but that becomes more clear when we talk about latency measurements later on. So about the design of this library, fundamentally it's about this input string that we can easily have a generic syntax with kind of a protocol contents equals value. You've seen this string a few times before. I think everyone probably just gets it and reads it and says, yeah, that's obvious. Um, I've highlighted here this plus one M, so we can extend the syntax a bit. It's not exactly the same as Scappy does it, but it's quite useful to have these kind of concepts, these syntax extensions for a traffic generator, a high speed traffic generator in particular. Um, this plus one M is a counter syntax, so it's gonna basically count in that uh, source IP and then count to, to create multiple flow uh, output. So for OVS testing, for example, that's particularly useful. We could extend it more with things like uh, a mode of counting, so increment or random and things like that. Um, so, so there's a lot of flexibility here in this, in this input string. So the other nice thing about that string is that you get kind of protocol flexibility. So any uh, protocol only knows about the inner strings inside it. And that means that it's quite easy to actually add a custom protocol or add a new protocol. For example, if IPv6 isn't supported, you add it to the either uh, type uh, that IPv6 can be next and you implement whatever IPv6 headers look like and DPK even has helper uh, structs for that and then you're done. So it's it's a kind of a pluggable 
it, it's not quite plug-in model, but it, the code itself uh, treats all the protocols generically, and you, it's quite easy to, to add new things. That's, that's really all I need to say. Um, what that allows is kind of a playful way of thinking about protocols. So, so for example, let's invent a new protocol called TSC. And really all it does is write eight bytes of timestamp data into the packet. So when that packet comes back, we can compare when it was sent versus when uh, it came back in, in uh, TSC clocks, right? So, so uh, CPU timestamping. Um, sometimes you're doing a, a tunnel NCAP or DCAP use case. Then you want to read that TSC back from a different location in the packet from where you sent it. So in that case, we can easily customize this protocol to say return offset or ret of equals 34 bytes into the packet. And using a little hack like this, sure, we need to hard code it into the TSC when we're generating the traffic. But because it's so interactive, it's just really easy to do that. You're like, oh, the TSC is totally garbage. What's going on? You remember you're doing a DCAP workload, so the packets coming back will have different byte offsets for the inner packet, for example. So hence, our TSC value will also be at a different location. You calculate it. So, so it's kind of an advanced power user tool. But because it's so interactive and quick to work with, things might go wrong. But when you realize they go wrong, they're very easy to fix up. And uh, if someone gives you a script that actually just works, then it'll just work. Um, other nice things, uh, a fuzz protocol will overwrite random bytes. So it consumes zero bytes on the wire. It just blitz a new byte over the rest of the packet payload somewhere. Really useful for fuzz testing. I mentioned OVS and packet parsing earlier. Of course, you want to test all sorts of invalid packets in that scenario. Well, this fuzz protocol can actually do that for you. So let's look at where we could use a library like this. For example, the net null PMD. Many people are probably familiar with it. You call Rx burst, you get a bunch of zero MBUFs of 64 byte lengths, I think, by default. Well, if we build the gen library into null PMD, then by passing in a string like the ones before, we now receive useful packet contents with different lengths, with varying IPs. Any of the, the modifying concepts in the string can be applied and we can inject them into any existing DPDK application without the need for a traffic generator. So this would allow things like unit tests to, or integration tests rather for an application to have the traffic not in a PCAP file, because if you want a million flows, you need a million packets in a PCAP file that doesn't scale. Whereas here is a really easy way to say plus one M and you get a million flows into your application. So really, really nice. Um, another use case of course, is to build a standalone DPDK based traffic generator from this library. And that's something that I done and, and paid a particular attention to some of the use cases around latency and things. So I think there was a question at the end of the last talk, you know, do you use a, a, a burst size of one or a very low burst size to ensure that, um, you know, the RX uh, doesn't have a buildup in the queue and that your latency and jitter measurements get totally out of, out, out of line or, or inflated artificially. So one of the dedicated uh, cores here in, in our uh, generator app is only reading from the NIC. It does nothing else uh, apart from TXing it into the gen library to get timestamping working, but I'll get to that. Um, so those kind of considerations were taken into account right when we were designing the data plane here, that you need a thread pinned to only Rx, and if it ever gets a big burst size, you need to flag that. You need to say, hey, there were 32 packets in this burst, or there were 16 packets in this burst. That means that the, 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 you know, the, the 15th packet of that burst has probably just arrived, but the first one has been there for a long time and is going to artificially inflate your latency. So things like that, we need to really be careful. Um, for example, tracking a histogram of the burst size on Rx is very useful to understand the quality of the rest of your latency data. So, so there's kind of links and tie-ins here where the design of your data plane needs to match up with what you're trying to measure because it will affect the overall uh, quality of, of your uh, jitter measurements in particular, but also latency as a whole. Um, talking more about what the L cores do in this application, for example, we could throw four RX cores into the equation, grab data from the RT gen library, transmit it over the NIC. Each uh, TX core here gets its own TX queue on the NIC. So you do end up burning through a bit of hardware in order to have lots of uh, traffic generation capabilities. But the upside there is that you have a lot of CPU cycle power available to generate very complex traffic patterns if you'd like. Uh, including updating checksums, uh, including invalidating some checksums, fuzz testing, et cetera, and to still get upwards of hundreds of millions of packets per second if you just throw some more CPUs at the problem. So it's a really nice scaling scaling solution to that. Um, I have a, a DUT over here on the left, but it really doesn't matter if we're testing OVS or any other application. Um, with four cores, I find it's, it's easy to saturate 100 gigabits, and on the two cores, we can also uh, receive back 100 um, 
million packets per second, not gigabits, apologies, million, million packets per second. Um, so you can do some, some really huge traffic generation with, with a, a, a couple of cores here. The reason that it's so important to only have one core polling from each NIC is if you're doing single flow testing, then your RSS doesn't work. So optimizing that single L core polling, a single NIC queue, and trying to keep that as absolute lightweight as possible and, and as maximum performance gives us quality data in latency and jitter, but it also makes sure that single flow testing uh, remains really high performant uh, and that the traffic generator in particular doesn't drop packets because that's that's ultimately a fail on an entire test run if you're dropping or if you have a queue build up on Rx as well. So, so that will impact quality of data as mentioned earlier. As you can see here from a usability perspective, uh, you can either echo a string into a FIFO which is just in forward slash temp forward slash tgen, um, the management thread will pick up whatever string you echo into the FIFO and then we'll push it into the gen library. That's about the easiest usability I can think of. You just go to your and any prompt on your, on your machine, you echo a string into a particular location, into a FIFO that this traffic generator listens on and you have your, your, your new traffic being sent. At the same time, sometimes you just want a better command line interface that's when looking at uh, zero MQ to transfer some of that data out, get some stats, things like that. Uh, of course, this command line interface could be built in any language you want because it's just zero MQ with JSON encoded contents. So there's some nice things we can do there. Um, I talked through the design rationale before I have it here in, in written form. Uh, it's all kind of the same. So really what I'm looking at or, or what we've built is, is one traffic generation library to rule them all. So we get unit tests, we can do some null PMD trickery to, to prototype and do integration tests with existing applications without modifying them, getting a lot of traffic generation capability. And then a standalone traffic generator app that, that's possible to build using that same library and then gives us back uh, all of these performance and latency reports, including plotting if we uh, you know, installed a, you know, pip install the, the, the surrounding HDRH um, libraries and things to do the, the graphing of those results for us. So all in all, I think it's it's quite a usable and nice library. Uh, I'm using it very regularly myself um, in, in daily development for, for traffic generation, for testing, for latency, for jitter, for various other things. Um, the status of the code right now is that a V2 of the gen library uh, patch set itself was sent to the mailing list by Ronan Randalls, who was uh, an intern here in Intel a couple of months ago, and or back in January, of course. Um, and he sent that to the mailing list. So the, so the, the initial POC of this library is, is existing. Uh, in the meantime, I have hacked some more features in, in what I call the messy version. And uh, internally, I'm using that regularly to, to do more, more complex traffic generation and more features with the latency and jitter, but it's not clean enough to send to the mailing list just yet. So yeah, that, that's the, the presentation. I have a few backup slides. Anyone who's uh, looking through the slides themselves do scroll down a bit further, but I'm also running out of time here. So at this point, uh, I'd like to open the floor to questions, and I hope this has been a useful presentation for you. Thanks, Harry. Do we have any, any questions? OK, um, the, the question is, uh, I have a couple of questions. Um, can it support, um, so, packet, so it can generate packets and transmit them. Um, so can it support? Uh, testing, it can test uh, packet rates and so on, but can it support uh, flow creation rates? So, for instance, if you want to test uh, like a firewall or net route or something like that, you would need to test uh, the packet rate and also the flow uh, acceptance rate. Currently, no. My focus has been very much on OVS, which basically means that my, my interest was blasting packets at it and getting responses from OVS and, and the number of switched packets was the 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 metric that I was looking for, um, I think T Rex is very powerful for that. There's a, an entire engine about you know uh, L4 and up, uh, like ge generation of other protocols and things. So I, I'm not sure this is currently at least the, the right tool for the job. I would probably recommend T Rex as as a better solution there. Um, short answer: No, it it cannot. Okay. The other question is. Um, how do you match packets that are received? Are they, do they need to be fully matched and uh, in the same order, or can you support matching like packets that have been netted and packets that have been queued? So and, yes. and queued by a queued, I mean held up by a shaper for some time. Yeah. So, so what we do with, with with latency and jitter in mind, in particular, you're asking about, I think. Yes. Yes. So, so what we do is we put the timestamp when we're sending from the CPU in the packet payload. And that payload traverses the, the DUT and then comes back. So 
you can put all the traffic out of order, you can shape it, you can drop it, whatever you like. Um, if it comes back to the board, we measure what latency that packet took. If we drop it, we measure the amount of packets that were dropped by the application over that, that time span. So yes, we absolutely can uh, measure the, the latency regardless of traffic shaping and regardless of anything else uh, that, that does work. You asked earlier, I think in the last uh, talk, about the accuracy of measurements and can we timestamp on TX and on hardware NIC RX. So that is possible with PTP uh, 1588. If we if we go do some trickery there, I think TGen, uh, sorry, T-Rex and MoonGen both have some features that enable that. A lot of my use case here is to get a good indication. I'm not looking for that last jittery nanosecond necessarily. Um, the other reason to not do that is if you want to deploy this traffic generator in a virtual context, like virtualized, um, it still works if you just do CPU TSCs. But relying on various hardware offload features and PTP registers and things like that, um, unfortunately, will not work in that context. So I made a decision to simplify and to measure the margin for error, and it's quite small. So the CPU uh, timestamping is actually more accurate than I had expected. OK, thanks. Thanks, good question. We're running kind of low on time, but I'm going to take one more question okay. from Liang here. Yeah, okay, hi, Harry. Uh, long time no see. So I, I just wonder, actually, when, if you have a plan to uh, send your message version to GitHub, and then we, can, uh, then we can have early access for that. <laughs> so yeah, good, good question. Um, there was some discussion with the community back in, uh, I think, April or so around, uh, you know, is there appetite in the DPDK community to, to upstream a library like Gen Library? Um, yeah, I, I don't want to send a, a very messy code base out on, onto the internet with my name on it. I, as you know, that's, that's just not really good practice. So I guess there, there's probably an open discussion we can have around, you know, what, what happens yeah, from here? Do we try and upstream this? Do we think there's value in it? Um, so yeah, good question. I, I, don't, I don't have an answer, yeah, to, just to be GitHub, perfectly honest. Yeah, but. Some GitHub uh, repo, we can have early access. Anyway, we can help you maybe yeah, as well, yeah. All possibilities. Let's see what the future brings. OK, thank you. Thanks. Oh, yeah, I think that wraps us up. Thanks very much, Eric. Thank you all.